Every day in South Africa, three women lose their lives at the hands of their intimate partners. This is the story of a woman who would live to tell a tale that would shock the nation. The abuse she suffered was at the hands of the man she loved, the man she trusted. The police of Port Elizabeth would later say that hers was one of the most horrifying cases of domestic abuse ever recorded in their city. Her willpower and strength is testimony to the amazing woman that she is. This is the story of Avril Gordon. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of Makeup and Mayhem True Crime with me, your host, Bella Monsu. I know we're not in our usual time slot and day, but bear with me and I hope that we will get back to our normal Friday uploads. Until then, don't worry, there will still be a weekly episode. So for those of you who are new, let me introduce myself. Here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. So basically, what this means is that every single week, I post a brand new video looking at a real-life crime from a psychological viewpoint. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not be aware of in an easy-to-understand format. So if all of that sounds like something that is right up your alley, then please do consider subscribing and joining the Balaboo family. But if podcasts are more your thing, don't worry, I got you covered. You can find me on all major streaming channels for my sister podcast, Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime. And on a side note, there's a pretty cool new feature on YouTube called The Super Things, which is now available on my channel. So if you see down below under the video, you will see a little button that says Super Things. If you would love to share your appreciation for what I do and my work, which I will be deeply thankful for, you can just click on that button and I will receive your contribution. So, just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's story contains material citing extreme domestic violence and is not for the faint of heart. As always, I mean absolutely no disrespect to the victim mentioned nor her family. The purpose of this video is to shed further light on this absolutely horrific crime that was committed while spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. As always, the story has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes real-life accounts, images and footage where available of individuals involved directly in the case. So, let's get to it. Unfortunately, like many of the other cases that I cover, there wasn't a great deal of information available on the childhood and early life experiences of both of the main individuals involved. But here's what we do know. Avril Gordon's childhood was far from picture perfect. Her family life was troubled and her father, whom she was incredibly close to, often abused alcohol. He would be so consumed in his own activities that he would sometimes even forget to pick her up from school. This led to an incredibly troubled family dynamic and a lack of care towards her development. I was unable to find any information about her mother during this time. Eventually, though, Avril ended up dropping out of school. She would later get married to a man whose name, unfortunately, I could not find, but whose surname was Van der Merwe. She was actually friends with his sister before meeting him. He would, unfortunately, later die quite tragically in a work accident. And she was alone for a while, until she met Freddy in Bloemfontein, the man who would forever change her life. Not very much is known about Frederick Gordon. But what we do know is that he was an Air Force sergeant. He had joined the Air Force in 1997 when he was in his late 20s. At some point in his life, he had been married and then he was divorced. I was unable to find any further information about that though. It would also later be divulged that he had a history of assault. However, I was also unable to find any more information about that as military records are kept quite tightly sealed. Freddie had then met Avril in 2009 in Bloemfontein. They had met through some friends and it was soon discovered that he was 10 years her junior. 
He was described as a polite and generally pleasant man. Avril saw him as a gentleman with a kind heart. However, from the early days of their relationship, he showed signs of aggression. Avril would later report that he had hit her whilst they were still in Bloemfontein, but every single time he had apologized and said he was incredibly sorry for what he had done and he would never do it again. She had left him many times, but he had come back begging for her to give him another chance. And she had, because she loved him, she believed him, and she thought that he could change. He then had told her he was being transferred to Port Elizabeth. And so she had left her job and she had moved to Port Elizabeth with him in the hopes of starting a brand new chapter. She was 52 years old. And in November of 2010, the couple got married. Initially, they had lived in the military barracks, but then they had moved into flat number 23 in Forest Hills. And that's when contact with her family ceased. Things had then progressed from bad to worse. Even though they both knew absolutely no one in Port Elizabeth, Frederick would accuse Avril of seeing other men, even though he would lock her up in the apartment when he went to work and not leave her any keys to exit. The very same month that they were married, the abuse began to escalate. Although he had been previously abusive, this was going to be nothing like that. And from November of 2010, Avril had been entrapped in the tiny apartment. She was completely cut off from communication. Frederick had taken all of her bank cards and cash. Every time her daughter, yes, she had a daughter from a previous marriage who was around 30 years old at the time, Every time she would call, she would get a subscriber unavailable message. Why? Because Frederick threw Avril's phone against the wall, ensuring that the only communication that she could have would be done in his presence. Her daughter would then call Frederick to get hold of her mom. But there was always an excuse. He was either at the shops or he was at work and he wasn't obviously around Avril. He did, however, let her speak to Avril once, in February, whilst the call was on speakerphone. Her daughter had attempted to get some sort of signal from her mother to ensure and check if everything was okay, but with Frederick watching, Avril had just responded that everything was fine. And that was that. But everything was far from fine. During this time, the abuse that Avril would suffer was unspeakable. Frederick had began drinking more and more often, and in the beginning, he would bring his friends over from work. Although they knew about her, she was sent to the bedroom of the tiny apartment until they had left. If she went to the shops with Gordon, she would wait in the car. However, even then, he would accuse her of speaking to people. If someone looked at her in the shop, there would be a fight. And back home, she would be punished for it. And soon, Frederick escalated his dangerous, controlling behavior. From being chained in the bathroom and bedroom left all day with only a loaf of bread, to being beaten with broken pieces of wood, or a metal chain with a lock on the end. Avril was subjected to much violence and unspeakable abuse. She recalls crying all day, but even with all the pain she was in, she would ensure that she made him dinner every single night. She would ask him about his day, and she would try and pretend that everything was okay. She also made sure that even if she was crying the entire day, that she would wipe her tears and not cry when he came back, because that would set him off again. He was unpredictable. Avril said it was like Freddy had two personalities. I was always afraid of him, even when he was in a good mood because I never knew when it would change. I was bathing one night, and he threw a kettle of boiling water over my back. And of course, during this time, she never received any medical attention for any of her injuries. And even when she was locked up in the bathroom, she was accused of speaking to people through the window. And this is how her days would pass, 
every single day. He would leave to work and she would be chained up. When he returned home, he would let her out and then he would proceed to beat her. Although she said she was not beaten every single day, when she was, it was severe. She would later say, Some nights he would tie our feet together or wrap the chain around our waists and then lock it so he could feel if I tried to get away. I had no option but to sleep like that. And when he drank, he became even more violent. He became a monster. Avril would state that often after beating her, he would apologize. But first, she had to have a bath or shower to clean all the blood off of her face and her hair and change out of her bloodied clothes. Many times the day after, he would feel sorry and he would read the Bible. He would also make her read it and then question her. She would later say, You don't know Freddy when he gets cross. He didn't have to open his mouth. He only had to show me with his eyes. A monster would come out. And in the last two weeks before the sordid tale came to light, the abuse intensified to twice daily. And so very shortly before she was discovered, Avril had attempted to take her own life by swallowing a handful of pills in an attempt to put an end to the abuse she was suffering. And it was around this time where and when Avril's muffled cries were heard by the neighbours of the surrounding flats. By some neighbours who weren't even aware that there was a woman living in the apartment, as they had only seen Frederick come and go alone from the flat. A neighbour, Cindy Setole, who was actually a police officer at the Galvindale police station, had moved next door to the Gordons at the end of February in 2011. The first time she had heard the cries was a month later, on March 22nd. She later stated for the record that she had initially ignored it as she did not have any idea where it was coming from. However, the next day when the crying had continued, she had pressed her ear to the Gordon's front door. It was then that she had heard chains being dragged on the tiled floor. And the cries sounded like they were coming from a room with echoes, namely the bathroom. She had knocked on the door, but... No one had answered. She had then approached the caretaker of the flats, Lino Polonio, to ask him what was happening in that apartment. All he had said was that there was a soldier from the Air Force that was living in there with his wife. But he said that he would definitely keep an eye on the apartment. Another neighbor, Lucinda Nomketa, who was an NMMU student, thought that there was a baby crying in the next door apartment when he had returned from his holiday on March 10th. This crying had continued almost every single day for two weeks. And on March 24th, he had approached the caretaker of the flats, Lino, and he had stated as per later records. I told him I heard a guy telling someone to shut up. He was beating her and she would cry. She would not say a word. It sounded like she was being suffocated. The caretaker had then told Lucinda that he was not the first person to complain and that he would look into it. Lucinda had then left the apartment block for the day. After a brief encounter with Frederick, which I will get into in a short while, it was at this point that Lino Polonio had then approached Officer Sitole again. And together, they agreed to take action. Cindy Sitole had called the police, and once they arrived, they spent a long time knocking on the Gordon's front door, trying to convince Frederick to open it up. However, he had refused, time and time again. They had then threatened to kick the door down, and it was at this point that he had stuck his head out of one of the windows. So if you're confused as to the entire layout of these buildings, it's basically like passageways and each door also has a window which will either be to the bathroom or to the kitchen and those access the passageways directly. So the police were able to see inside, behind him and through the window. They were able to see that the place was incredibly dark and there were no lights on. Frederick had then told them that there was no electricity in the apartment and that he couldn't open the door because he didn't have the keys. 
Yeah, he was somehow locked inside of his own apartment without any keys. The police had then demanded to speak to his wife, to which he had responded that she was drunk and sleeping, making absolutely no headway with Frederick after giving him a few more warnings. They had then kicked in the door, and the sight that had faced them was nothing short of horrific. There was blood over all the walls and the passageway. There was a strong stench in the air, and there were empty beer cans strewn everywhere. In the bedroom, parts of the mattress were also soaked in blood. Clumps of Avril's hair were stuck to a page in the Bible. The verse had read, Niemand baro halasonde ni which translated from Afrikaans means no one has remorse for their sins. In the bathroom, there was blood all over the room and there were piles of clothes on the floor that too were drenched in blood. And it was at this point that an older white woman was found, covered in blood on the bathroom floor. She had cuts on her nose and ears. Her nose was broken. Her upper lip was swollen. The wounds on her legs were starting to fester. It also appeared that she had been burnt with a cigarette. She was shaking. She was crying. She was traumatized. She only had on a black fleece jacket with absolutely nothing underneath. Those on the scene reported that it was something that they never wanted to see again. When Lusanda had returned back to the flats, he saw the police were swarming the place. Lusanda had then seen her when he went upstairs. He had asked her why had she remained quiet all of this time, but she was unable to respond due to the extensive injuries sustained and the level of shock she was in. She would later state that it was like hell, and she was lucky to be alive. And so, in March of 2011, Frederick was arrested. But it would take over three years to finalize the case. Avril was left partially deaf, blind in one eye, and battled to walk and talk as a result of the abuse. Even through all of this, though, she still referred to Frederick as Freddy. Her sister-in-law, the sister of her ex-husband, Tracy van der Merwe, who during this time was her primary caregiver, would state that Avril struggled to do anything for herself. She would also later state, He may not have killed her, but he certainly destroyed the person she once was. They must lock him up and throw away the key. Her daughter... Valerie Figueroa Shaw, 31 years old, from her previous marriage, who lived in Johannesburg, had rushed to her mother's side upon hearing the news. So at this point, I'm sure you're like, wait, Bella, yeah, she had a daughter. Well, where was she all this time? Well, her daughter had later stated that she had been in close contact with Avril up until the point where she had married Frederick in November of 2010. When Avril had met him, she had started to pull away from the rest of her family. According to her daughter, I was not allowed to speak to my mom on the phone. The one time I spoke to her, it was on speakerphone. When I asked her about it, she ended the call. Valerie had also struggled to collect her mother's belongings, as the scene that had met her at the apartment was incredibly disturbing. Frederick Gordon, meanwhile, 42 years old, was accused on charges of rape, kidnapping, and attempted murder. All this time, Frederick was going through the court process, managing to delay again and again. First, he had changed lawyers, as he hadn't been happy with his legal aid attorney. Then, his employer froze his salary, which resulted in the termination of his new private lawyer. He was left representing himself in sentence proceedings as all four private lawyers that he had approached refused to represent him and the legal aid board denied his request to be represented by them again. Yeah, but I'm struggling to find some sort of sympathy or empathy for him here. 
Shem. Luckily, throughout all of this, he remained in jail. Towards the end of 2011, he was also under mental observation for three months in Fort England Psychiatric Hospital. However, he was declared fit to stand trial and it was deduced that he was fully aware of his actions at the time. Frederick's behaviour during the court proceedings, though, was nothing short of disturbing. Aside from the fact that he pleaded not guilty to all the charges laid against him, he went on to make some shocking statements. Prepare yourself, I'm warning you now, this is a wild ride. Firstly, he would say that the blood found in the apartment was not human's blood, it was pig's blood. Forensic analysis would debunk this. He then said that the plastic surgeon who had operated on Avril was corrupt and he had faked the images that he had shown the court. Another outlandish claim was that Avril Gordon had a look-alike and it was that woman who was in the photos, not her. But wait, in the next breath he claimed that the photos had been doctored by journalists. He would then state that Avril was still in love with him and she had told him on numerous occasions that she was going to withdraw all the charges. He had then accused Avril of inflicting her own injuries because her family were after his pension money. Also, the prosecutor was apparently an impersonator and the magistrate were two different people. But I'm not even done yet. Also, people had been hired to kill him apparently by Avril's daughter. But wait, this is by far the most ridiculous one yet. He was allegedly granted bail and the court orderly had opened the door for him. He had then shown him two doors. One door led to St. Albans prison and the other door led to freedom. He had accidentally gone in the door to St. Albans prison and that is where he was now stuck. What? Absolute chaos. Besides these bizarre statements, he would continue his chaotic ramblings and have outbursts of laughter during testimonies. I mean, whilst Avril bravely testified in camera to her ordeal, which I've heard was an incredibly heartbreaking testimony to listen to, he had smirked to himself. Avril had been petrified of seeing him again, and so she had been prepped on how the proceedings would go and what to expect. For her to be able to give that testimony showed such bravery. Frederick, on the other hand, only showed a lack of remorse throughout the proceedings. He had actually laughed during her testimony, and he had asked to cross-examine her himself. He would also go on to accuse the court of handling his case irregularly. The plastic surgeon, Dr. Conrad Hustra, whom Avril was referred to, showcased images in court of what she looked like on arrival. He stated that without treatment, she would have ended up looking grotesque. She was beaten so badly that she ended up undergoing reconstructive surgery to her head, face and some parts of her body. Her first surgery had lasted four hours. X-rays had shown that she had a broken rib and the healed ribs had shown evidence that they had been broken more than once before. But because the fractures were left untreated, they had eventually healed themselves. Blunt force trauma to her chest had resulted in internal bleeding of her lungs and a buildup of fluid on her chest, which was a life-threatening complication. It was later stated that there was no sign that any medical attention had been received by Avril. All her wounds were left to heal by themselves and the injuries would have caused Avril to be acutely ill and in excruciating pain. Gynecologist Dr. Anton Hryov stated that her injuries were also consistent with sexual abuse. Psychologist Estelle DeWitt testified that Avril suffered from extreme post-traumatic stress disorder and required extensive counseling. She also stated that there was a possibility of dementia present and that Avril would need to see a neurosurgeon at least four times a year going forward. And of course, Matthias Hoffman from the South African Police Services Forensic Unit testified that the blood found in the Forest Hills flat 
all matched Avril's DNA. Whilst listening to all of this evidence being given, Frederick shook his head, laughed, and with a shaky hand, had written down points of argument. The caretaker of the apartment flats, Lino Polonio, also testified that he had received several complaints during a four-month period. He had said, Different tenants complained. They said it sounded like a child being hit. I said no children lived in that house. The morning of March 24th, Frederick had been booked off of work and he had arrived at the flat of the caretaker with a case full of beer. When he was told about the complaints, he had of course denied them, but he was curious to find out if it was his neighbor Cindy who had complained. He had then ominously told the caretaker with a grin on his face, don't worry, I will show her tonight. It was at that point that the caretaker had then approached Cindy and, well, you know the rest. When it came time for Frederick to speak, he had said that he never harmed his wife, she never sustained any injuries, and that he had never said a bad word about her. He claimed that her injuries were as a result of a mugging early in March of 2011. That chain of events was dismissed as improbable by the surgeon who had seen Avril after she was rescued though. There were both old and new wounds on her, which signaled that they were unlikely to have been caused by just one incident. Whilst testifying, Frederick then asked if Avril was listening to what he was telling the court. He would go on to insist that Avril was in love with him. He would even say that she had visited him while he was in jail and she had told him she would drop the charges. However, that was ruled as impossible as she was in hospital at that same time. He insisted it was the media and the police that were in cahoots to frame him and steal his pension fund. But he also went on to argue that Avril was the sole cause of the breakdown of their marriage. And that she abused him, she was aggressive, she abused alcohol, and she had had numerous affairs during their marriage. No surprise here, but he was unable to find any witness to testify on his behalf. He was eventually found guilty of assault and rape, but to the shock of many, he was not found guilty on the charge of attempted murder. Yeah, I don't get that call either. Prior to his sentencing, Avril had said, I just take one day at a time, but I won't really be able to move on until he is behind bars. I trust the court to impose an appropriate sentence. I just want him to go away for a long time. Eventually, after three years and countless delays, thanks to Frederick, the trial would conclude in 2014. And Frederick was sentenced to 40 years in prison. 10 years for assault, 5 years for kidnapping, 10 years for rape, and an additional 10 years for the second charge where Frederick used a knife. He will have to serve 25 years before he is eligible for parole. Despite his conviction, he maintained he was innocent right up until the very end. But the court cases were not over just yet. Later that year, divorce proceedings would begin as Avril attempted to cut all ties from her monster husband. During the years of the trial, Avril had been dependent on the medical aid that Frederick had as a result of his membership to the South African National Defense Force. That medical aid that they shared ceased to be 90 days after his sentencing. However, all the results of Frederick's actions remained. Avril was left completely deaf in one ear, blind in one eye and with 62% vision in her right eye, battling to walk and to talk. The bones in her legs did not heal properly after her ordeal, which led to many difficulties. She was therefore unable to drive and walked with a limp. As a result of the blows to her face and to her nose, she developed sinus problems. She was also unable to take care of herself, battling to bathe herself or even to make the bed. And thus working and earning a living was not really possible for her as a result of all the torture she had endured. Avril and the lawyer who took on her case pro bono therefore demanded Frederick's SANDF pension. Frederick, meanwhile, contested the divorce. 
However, the final verdict was that Frederick Gordon had to pay Avril 2 million rand in restitution. That money would go towards a full-time caregiver, medical expenses, and further cosmetic surgery that was required to improve Avril's quality of life. The divorce was finalized in July of 2015, and that damages claim formed a part of the official divorce documentation. There was a 30-year period on that order, which basically means that any income he would make, even if he was paroled in 25 years, would go towards honoring that court order. I mean, it's the least he could do. There was, thankfully, an amazing outreach of love and support from the residents of Nelson Mandela Bay when this case hit the local media. Dawn, the DA Women's Network, received a flood of compassionate donations, piles of beautifully wrapped gifts, cards, packets of size 32 clothing, bags of toiletries, and boxes of shoes and handbags. In addition, Avril received free legal help and a savings account was also started by the attorneys in order to receive and keep all of her donations in one place. And she continued to be blessed. She received new pairs of glasses as well as a new set of teeth from a dental laboratory. Hi, my name is Avril. I went through hell a year ago. But today I'm looking forward to the future with the help of my sister-in-law. She helps me a lot through everything. Avril was always soft-spoken and shy when she was speaking to the media. She had said, I am just so grateful because after everything, I have been given my smile and my sight back. I want to thank everyone who prayed for me and sent me messages and cards and gifts. I had no idea so many people cared. It really means a lot. She went on to state that the first thing she wanted to do with her new eyes and her new teeth was to bite in to a cook sister as well as to resume reading the thriller novels that she so enjoyed. I mean, a lady after my own heart. But on a deeper level though, a social worker who was assessing her stated that Avril was self-conscious about the way she looked and was always aware of people staring at her when she was out in public. However, that did not stop her from using her experience to try and help others. She was part of a panel discussion on domestic abuse, sharing her story. She had said, If you trust a family member or friend, then tell them what is happening. Do not keep it to yourself. Tell someone you can trust. So, at this point, some may still ask, Well, why didn't Avril leave at the first sign of abuse? But there's so much more to abuse and domestic violence than what meets the eye. So let's dig deeper. In South Africa, between 2019 and 2020, 2,695 women were murdered. That means that every three hours, another woman loses her life. Femicide here in South Africa is five times higher than the global average, and South Africa has the fourth highest interpersonal violence death rate out of 183 countries, listed by the World Health Organization in 2016. As of a 2016 study too, 26% of women reported physical, sexual, or emotional abuse by their partners in their lifetime. But those are just the reported numbers. Many women have not and will not admit to the abuse that they have suffered or are still currently suffering. And that is the truth. So why do women, and in this case, Avril, stay? Domestic violence doesn't always start as full-blown violence. The thing about a manipulator is that often you are not even aware of the manipulation until it is too late. In Frederick's case, he appeared charming to those who knew him, and when Avril first met him, she thought he was a gentleman. She stated that she remembered thinking that he was kind and soft-hearted. This was the Freddy that she knew and loved. The Freddy that married her. The Freddy that exchanged vows to love and cherish her. And it was only after the marriage and relocation to an area where Avril was far from everything that she knew, when the abuse had escalated. It was clear that to Frederick, Avril was an object, a possession that belonged to him, 
and with whom he could do whatever he pleased. Initially, Avril believed that she could help Frederick. I mean, after all, this was the man she had married. He could change, right? And this in itself is not uncommon. And after the beatings, often Frederick would apologize. Avril would later say, When he beat me, all I could see in his eyes were anger. But when he apologized, his whole look would be softer. And that is how many in a dominant position exercise their control. This level of control is not something that develops overnight, but rather in a gradual and far more dangerous way, because in this manner, it is often overlooked. This is known as coercive control, and it is a calculated strategy for domination. It begins by grooming the victim, gaining their trust, then employing fear within them. That fear, however it is demonstrated, perhaps physically or sexually, is what makes the threat credible, and therefore the actions are coerced. Although Frederick's behavior at the end was incredibly toxic, to say the least, in the beginning, it wasn't. There was love there initially, and so that is what is remembered first and foremost. In her own words, Avril had said, Love is blind. And I'm sure the fact that Frederick had warned her that if she reported him to anyone, let alone the police, that he would have her killed, didn't help much either. So that in part explains the emotional and the psychological component. But then of course there is the very important practical and physical component. On a practical level, Avril didn't know anyone in Port Elizabeth. And Frederick had kept all of her bank cards and her money. She had no access to a phone and she was isolated. She was without a job and income. She was without friends and family. She was alone. A direct result of Frederick's actions. And the result he desired. Contrary to popular belief, leaving a toxic or abusive relationship is often almost as, or in some cases, more dangerous as remaining in it. That is not to say that one should not get out of a situation as soon as it is safe and possible, but rather that outsiders and onlookers need to understand that there are so many complexities at play. The control within the relationship doesn't just disappear once it is over, but rather the victim of the abuse may find themselves the target of the abuse. This time, not in a bid to keep them in the relationship, but to punish them for leaving it. The fact remains that no one asks to be in this situation, and it often doesn't happen overnight. And often it is difficult for the victim to see the perpetrator for who they really are. I mean, take for example the concept of Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a coping mechanism to a captor or abusive situation. Basically, in this situation, people develop positive feelings towards their captors or abusers over time. Keeping all of that in mind will go far in a bid to reduce victim blaming and shaming. And then we look at Frederick. After a three-month mental evaluation, he was found fit to stand trial. I could not unfortunately find further information regarding the outcome of that evaluation. So I will speak to the characteristics that are evident to the observer. Frederick, first and foremost, did appear to have issues with alcohol use, as well as a history of assault. This was mentioned briefly in military statements, however, further information was not provided. It is also evident that Frederick had an incredibly manipulative streak within him, and he thrived off of the control he exerted over Avril. His desire to fully control every aspect of her life could be linked to his occupation as an Air Force sergeant in one of two possible ways. He was either used to having full control in every aspect of his job, and thus this overflowed into his personal life. Or he lacked some form of control and power in his job and position and thus attempted to regain that deficit at home. Unfortunately, I am not familiar with ranking in the military and the various responsibilities that his position would have held, so I cannot speak to the role that he had there. Frederick also displayed many aspects of paranoia. 
Firstly, within the beginning of the marriage, where he would constantly be accusing Avril of cheating on him, and he would also say that people in the shopping centers were always staring at them. This paranoia only seemed to increase as the days and weeks progressed, and by the time he was standing trial, he was blaming the plastic surgeon, the advocate, the media, the journalists, and the magistrate for playing a role in framing him for this crime. His behavior in court though, laughing and joking, especially during the testimony of Avril, was quite disturbing. But at the same time, it reminded me of another law enforcement perpetrator, Rosemary Ndlovu. Remember her? She also behaved ridiculously during her trial. Many believed in an attempt to appear mentally unsound. Whether Frederick was acting in this manner for the same reasons, or whether he truly found Avril's pain funny, is up for debate. Regardless of any mental issues he may have though, he is still 100% responsible for his actions and he was fully aware of what he was doing during the extended time period that he did it. And although he is behind bars for now, Avril is the one who, although free, is still so constricted and trapped in so many ways, her life forever altered. Although a horrific chapter of her life is over, Avril is left with physical and emotional scars, which very well may remain forever. Avril Gordon may just be one woman, but she could be your friend. She could be your mother, your cousin, your sister, your aunt, your daughter. She is the face of so many who have been victims at the hands of men they loved, and whom they thought loved them. If her neighbours had not said anything, or had even waited longer to report it, she may very well have not survived her ordeal. As I say so many times and in so many different episodes, if you hear something, see something, or notice something, say something. You could very well be saving or changing someone's life. If you, someone you know, or someone you suspect is a victim of domestic violence, please say something. If you are in South Africa, you can call the Domestic Violence Helpline on 0800 150 150 or the GBV Hotline on 0800 428 428. Both are toll-free numbers which will incur no charges. I would like to end this episode with a quote from Avril as this is her story after all. In the beginning, he said he loved me. Now I think it was more companionship than love. I do not think a person would physically abuse someone they love. This is the message I want to give to women who are going through the same thing. Get out before it is too late. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Avril Gordon's story. This episode was incredibly difficult for me to research, compile, film, and edit, so I truly appreciate you taking the time to watch. Until next week, stay safe, stay blessed, and stay the amazing human beings that I know each and every single one of you are. Bye!